to resonate through the room uh, with this uh, gadget that Hans just attached to me. Uh, the, the book that I've been asked to discuss is uh, an autobiographical work called Encounters, uh, and it comes uh, with the uh, additional feature uh, beside my uh, uh, beautiful, carefully crafted prose uh, of pictures of my parents, wife, children, and above all, my basset hound. And uh, I, ur I urge you to buy this book for no other reason than to contemplate the beauty of the, the animal uh, uh, in the pictorial part of the, of the work. Uh, that's not why I've been asked to speak today. Uh, uh, I've been asked to provide you with, uh, I suppose, what would be called po the political teachings of my work. I, I, I ran across that absolutely ghastly term, political teachings, while um, doing research for a book that I'm now laboring, uh, laboring over uh, on Leo Strauss, his disciples, and their political influence. And anything they like is a political teaching. Anything they don't like is dangerous to democracy and fascist or something like that. But my, my book has good political teachings, so I'm very happy to stand up here and present them to you today. Um, there, in addition to the, the anecdotal parts of the work, um, the biographies of famous people, uh, which was part of the obligatory assignment uh, that the publisher uh, imposed on me when I signed a contract, um, there, there are two, um, should we say, sort of crucial uh, political teachings, to use the term again, or political doctrines, uh, which come through uh, to anyone who reads this book with some care. Uh, one of them is a very detailed and often sarcastic discussion of the various lefts. Um, the other, which I'll get around to afterwards, um, is uh, an attempt to distinguish right and left. And uh, I've always been interested in the problems of political terminology and political epistemology, uh, and you know exactly what distinguishes one political position from another, and also with the muta mutations of right, left, um, uh, in the Western world in the last 150 years. Uh, and uh, as I indicate in the book, perhaps somewhat disingenuously, it is not entirely true, I became interested in the neoconservatives because they seem to be an interesting case um, of what is essentially a leftist group that has been able to um, present themselves effectively as conservative opposition. Um, but what I, what I do is sort of look at the left uh, at the time that I was a graduate student, and I think you can see in Nuce sort of in uh, sort of outline form what becomes characteristically leftist afterwards. If you read my chapter on Herbert Marcuse, uh, it is more than simply a celebration of a fellow German Jew who was part of a, of a very humanistic, uh, a humanistically educated generation who landed up in the United States, who was in some ways very conservative, culturally conservative, despite all the goofy things that he wrote, and who was very nice to me personally. Uh, it, it also is an attempt to understand him as a kind of transitional figure between an older left, real left, I mean a kind of Stalinist, uh, communist, you know, left, the, uh, as it exists at least in the Western world, you know, in the, uh, in the Parti Communiste de France or the uh, uh, Partito Communiste in Italy, the two largest Western communist parties. Um, and uh, somebody who always, you know, has a warm spot for Stalin, is always willing to justify uh, uh, his crimes um, on, on the basis of the principle that it takes, that you have to break eggs to make an omelet or something like that, but at the same time had, a, had, a, had an intellectual philosophical orientation that seemed to come out of the old world at an earlier period, out of the 19th, even 18th century. Um, and in some ways, he seems to be almost emblematic for this, this left that I encountered as a young man. Yeah. And I cannot say that I was terribly fond of their politics. And I said I was absolutely nauseated by Marcuse's 
um, willingness to defend Stalin's crimes. On the other hand, um, I was impressed by what I saw of, um, uh, of a traditional humanistic kind of learning that was mixed with this obviously repulsive political stance. Uh, but by the end of his life, as you know, particularly after he failed to obtain um, a, a post-retirement graduate position at Yale where I studied with him, uh, he went off to California and became totally bonkers. He just went off the deep end um, and uh, uh, helped possession his later, his, his last few years uh, to fashion the new left in its ugliest uh, forms in, in the United States. Um, I remember at the time that he died, National Review wrote some very nasty obituary, uh, almost as nasty as the one that Bill Buckley later penned about poor Murray Rothbard. Um, and I, I immediately uh, put pen to paper and wrote a defense of him, which National Review, of course, never published. Um, because he was, he was you know, viewed as a bad person because of his pro-communist positions, but of course I had a very different memory of him. Um, and, and then, and then uh, uh, I write about a, uh, three different types of leftists that I encountered while sitting in the Yale Sterling Library in the Graduate Hall. Um, and uh, one kind of leftist, and this, this was sort of what pretended the future of the left, were very whiny New York Jews, and they saw anti-Semitism in every, you know, gentlemanly wasp who was walking there, he really hates us, and so forth. My own impression, as I also indicate in the book, is that the old wasp patrician class was totally disintegrating at this time. Um, and uh, they had been perhaps overly gracious to the newcomers by letting them come in and take over, uh, while they, you know, uh, uh, continue to commit suicide as a, a hegemonic or ruling class in the United States. Their influence had actually declined enormously in post-World War II period, and much of it was a kind of self-eclipsing that they, they engage in in this period. And the whining Arab Jews were always complaining, everyone's an anti-Semite, this one's a fascist, this, and um, uh, when, when it came to, this, to the war between Israel and uh, the Arabs, they all became extreme uh, Zionist nationalists. And so, uh, th then you had the Catholics, who also in America sort of view themselves as a minority, and they would generally follow the lead of the Jewish intellectuals. But uh, when the war broke out between the Israelis and the Arabs, their position was, we have to go to church and pray, or, you know, we have to be Thomas Aquinas, or do something like that, or we have to be, we have to be a prayer vigil. Um, so that was sort of like, like more consistent. And then I finally described what I met of remnants of the old wasp patrician in my book. And these people would play golf, um, try to get some position in their family business, uh, yet they seemed to elicit violent uh, hatred, um, especially from the Jewish Marxists who were, you know, saw them as rivals or people who had excluded them from positions. Um, I dislike them myself, or I despise them, because they seem to be a ruling class that has lost any nerve um, and any sense of command. And uh, uh, my favorite uh, uh, of all political sociologists is Pareto, who understood that classes fall from power because they lose their nerve, which is also what my friend Sam Francis taught. Uh, and other classes rise because they take advantage of disintegration. And, uh, you know, I, I feel in some ways sorry for the old wasp patricians. On the other hand, I feel utter contempt for them, for the way they abandoned power and engaged in spasms of self-mortification afterwards. Self-hate, politics of guilt, etc. Uh, so this is sort of my descriptions of the left. And if you read the work, you know, and then it comes to the neoconservatives, and I see this as a more moderate kind of left, and a post, what I call post-Marxist left. I wrote a book on this, uh, trying to show how the post-Marxist left is different from the Marxist left, because they're not really socioeconomic in their orientation. They're cultural. Uh, they're heavily influenced by, by Adorno and the Frankfurt School which is an accusation that is sometimes made against them by religious fundamentalists and John Birchers in the United States. It's perfectly correct. It's perfectly correct. Um, you read the authoritarian personality, uh, you have the whole scenario 
you know, of, 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 of what the left intends to do. This has been a cultural left. They hate the bourgeoisie, but not because they see them as economic oppressors, they see them as fascist, sexist, religious men. People will have to be entirely retrained if necessary, uh, you know, sent to some internment camp or something like this. And this is the left that will end up taking over in the end, and particularly after the disintegration of the Soviet empire. And the two, but I would argue that in the West, this left takes over earlier because this left um, are basically the kooks who are part of the communist parties but whom the communists sort of discipline and control. And they're also the nutcases in Eastern Europe whom the communists or the Stalinists are able to control. These, these are the leftists who will take power, the, the anti-fascist left, heavily influenced by a kind of Frankfurt School agenda. And what I, what I suggest in my book is they take over the entire Western world. I mean, I, the, the extent of their rule uh, and their cultural hegemony cannot be undone. I mean, they have power over the media, they have power uh, over the state, the state apparatus, public administration. Uh, and opposing them is like knocking your head against the wall. Um, and I gave these lectures in Romania um, and these seem to be sort of a relatively untouched people because they had the good or bad fortune of living under Soviet rule for a while. Ceausescu, I know, is a horrible man, uh, but at least they were spared Western cultural Marxist influences for a few decades longer than the Germans, who seem to be the worst basket, psychological basket cases in the world. Um, uh, but the same thing, of course, is happening in France, in England, um, Spain, certainly in Spain. Um, and in the United States. Um, and I think many of the impulses leading to this cultural, this new form of cultural hegemony come out of the United States. I mean, one of the things I try to show in my book on cultural Marxism, and I post the post-Marxist left, and I suggest this here as well, um, is that the United States is a breeding ground for many of these ideas. Uh, the authoritarian personality was not considered the work of uh, quirky leftist in the United States. It had mainstream respectability. And people like Seymour Morton Lipset wrote in defense of this because this was to be what we as American patriots could do to overcome prejudice and build a pluralistic society. So let's say the model for this comes out of, the, comes out of American globalism. Uh, globalism and bureaucracy, you know, the sort of a fatal combination which you now see in the European Union, which is not really about Europe, but it's about global bureaucracy and the re-socialization of nations. Um, so if you read my book carefully, it is obvious that I'm you know, heavily influenced, uh, or, or the, book, the book shows the influences of other works, and if there are any kind of political teachings there, uh, it's an attempt to show how the left, as we now know it, came to be formed during my, during my youth. I can see, see these different groups. And the Marxist and the traditional Marxist losing influence to this. And I, you know, I, I just wanted this one conversation between Eugene Genovese, who went from being a uh, sort of a very unusual, idiosyncratic Marxist to becoming very conservative and very Catholic, is having a conversation with Eric Haugsbaum, who has, I think, I don't know if he's still alive. If he is, he's still a member of the English Communist Party and will defend Stalin. Uh, to, you know, or did to his dying day. Um, if he's alive, it's about 98. Uh, but Hobsbawm and uh, Genovese are lamenting the fact that the communists, um, we used to have good communists, now there's these crazy people who run around with this exotica, you know, glorifying exotic things and crazy lifestyles. You know, what, what is the left coming to? And I was at present in that conversation uh, back in 1970, because I, I was young, I was giving a presentation at the American Historical Association, a panel with Genovese, and Hobsbawm came over and congratulated me for my, my remarks in which I showed the difference between true Marxist-Leninism and this sort of new leftist sentimentality, which eventually morphs into this uh, cultural Marxist monstrosity in, in the West. And uh, all the traditional communists liked what I had to say, and I've always told people I've had a warm, I have a warm spot for communists after seeing the absolute uh, disastrous types who have taken their place in the West. Um, it's like, you know, you go from the frying pan into the fire. The, the, the second um, 
I might say political teaching here, which is sort of interesting. And also, I was interested in Richard Spencer's remarks because I sort of recognized in some of them, not his remarks on race consciousness, but in some of the other ones, the, uh, the effects uh, of my book on the conservative movement, uh, in which I show to what extent the conservative movement gives up on classes, nations, you know, and becomes preoccupied with values. And it lands, of course, the values change. There's a new value every week. It depends on the election. And increasingly, their values are leftist values. So the argument they then make is that they believe in values, and the left has no values. We have values, you don't. But leftist values, too. They're leftist values, and you have leftist values. You know, what's the difference? Except you have different, your leftist values are 20 years older. They have newer leftist values. And this is the only difference that I can see. Um, but that's what happens when a movement, I think, really becomes disengaged um, from the bourgeoisie or from traditional nations or nations or something like that. So ba basically, the, the, the right and the left are both peddling globalist ideologies. Uh, the right's globalist ideology is human rights, democracy, and bombing other countries to make sure they get the, you know, they get the, the message from us. Uh, the left's uh, ideology is, you know, use, is, is reconstructing everybody, people's consciousness at home. Uh, so this, this seems to be like the, 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 the major difference. But they both are operating with leftist values. Um, it seems to me that the right, insofar as it is distinguishable from the left, and that this sounds very basic, it's sort of like the kind of basic definition that one of my intellectual, if not always political heroes, Carl Schmitt, who might have a book, comes up with. And Schmitt, of course, gives you the uh, l'essence du politique or the begriff des politischen. And this really comes down, which is the same, by the way, that, um, uh, that Gianfranco Emilio, who was quoted before, comes up. But the essence of the political is friend-enemy distinction. Uh, well, I would say that the essence of the left is equality, egalitarianism. That is what holds everything on the left together. Now, the essence of the right is not necessarily liberty, it's inequality. Uh, I, I think I presented this last year, people were aghast when I said this, but I'll say it again, um, that uh, libertarians, to the extent that they're on the right, uh, such as Heron's Hyman Hoppe, would believe that inequality is fine. This is the natural state of people. Left libertarians tend to be egalitarians. And I, I, would make, I would make that distinction. They want equality, they like civil rights movements, um, equality of lifestyles, everybody should be able to cross borders, everybody's interchangeable with everybody else, and everyone you know, has human rights or something. Okay, so I would say that, that even among libertarians, there's a very definite, it's a critical distinction that I see. And th th this is, how in my book on the conservative movement, I could say that you know, even some fascists and some libertarians um, can belong on the right because they're opposing egalitarian projects. Um, and they believe that human beings are inherently unequal. Okay? Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this to praise everybody on the right. I'm just saying this is what distinguishes right from left. Um, the problem is, now, now, is that the, what is the legitimate political uh, spectrum and those political parties that are not being denounced as fascist, racist, anti-Semitic or something like that or uh, anti-feminist um, uh, are all committed to equality and they're all committed to using the state to achieve equality. Okay, so so the, uh, the only parties I see in the United States are leftist parties. I, by the way, I, was, I, I know that, I, that this may be an expression of either naivete or senility in my case, but I was struck by the fact that um, the neoconservatives and the Republican Party went after Rand Paul for simply questioning uh, provision two and seven, I think, of the civil rights, thing, saying that it gave the government too much power to interfere in private social relations in this I think, if anything, that that is a, uh, a glaring understatement in terms of the effects. This is something which has been used to sue the pants off people because they don't serve blacks or some other group or women coffee, fat, it's not warm enough or whatever. The Civil Rights Act has been 
the beginning of all kinds of government mischief and social engineering against the private sector. But once he had said this, and of course he cried, he goes back and he expresses the, his regret, he couldn't be on Freedom Rise with Martin Luther King and he had this, but, but somehow once he had opened Pandora's box, the entire respectable Republican, um, which of course means neoconservative establishment, violently attacked him. Now, I cannot understand how you can get government off your back, if this is what they say they're good. I hear Jonah Goldberg, who attacked him as the ally of bigots, and you know, this or he always is yapping about economic freedom, this guy. How do you have economic, how do you have freedom unless you can push the government out of these relations? At the, at the minimum. And of course, I know the people using it have no desire for any freedom, they just want to bomb Iran. I mean, I fully understand what this is. And they're not going to get rid of, the, of Obama's medical plan. They're just going to uh, redistribute, do something a little bit different. I understand why the Republicans are useless, basically leftist, uh, and also bellicose opposition to the Democrats. But you, you would think that a remark like that would be allowable. You know, um, if uh, Jonah Goldberg can accuse um, uh, FDR of being like Hitler and they're all Nazis, and he says this and nobody cares. But as soon as you touch the Civil Rights Act and you notice that it infringes on privacy, that it does not allow you to form men's clubs, that every, all the evils that go on in terms of government, social engineering, um, uh, diversity classes, all of this goes back to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You would think at the very least you would be able to question this. But even this is unacceptable. And I think that the reason is that both of our political parties, left and acceptable left and right, which will appear together in every issue of the Washington Post. You have the neocons and the liberals. Uh, you open the New York Times. You have David Brooks, or Ross Dowdat, whatever, I don't know how you pronounce his name, uh, some silly name, and he writes even sillier columns. But if, if, if you read this stuff, it is obvious, it is obvious that there's no significant difference between these people, and they're, they're all equally on the left. And this is something that I became interested in, and one of the things I do in my autobiography is I look at people who are generally considered leftist, but who seem more conservative to me, or more rightist, you know, than so-called conservatives uh, of, of today. And I look at somebody like Christopher Lash, who has these crazy guild socialist ideas. At first he was a, a kind of quasi-Marxist. Later he became a Catholic corporatist, although he remained a Presbyterian. Uh, and, but, but if you're talking about family issues, he had very traditional views on men and women and, and, and other things, and was actually appalled by, you know, by the cultural Marxism, well, books attacking cultural Marxism. Um, and I showed that even in the case of Genovese, when he was a Marxist, you know, and, and even expressed sympathy for the Vietcong, uh, he sounded much more like a conservative than any conservative that I hear on Fox News. Um, I mean, this, it, 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 as, as you, you read this work, and as I wrote it, I became aware, you know, of how far my country had drifted in about 30 years. And I think the change in Europe is far greater. I mean, in a country like Germany or France or Spain, or England than anything that we've seen in the United States. Because for a long time, I, I, I think the United States, while it spread these poisons, were also, it was also sort of protected against them. Because Americans don't take ideas very seriously. You know, and just the way Romanians have not been exposed to cultural Marxism yet. Uh, and, you know, it's, it doesn't work, is it good for business, or something like that. Um, but I, 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 I noticed that what happened is that American patriotism became defined, even during the Cold War, in terms of whether you support a certain kind of radical social engineering. You know, and this, I think, uh, uh, Richard Spencer ma mentioned Harry Jaffa. And Jaffa, of course, who becomes one of the major spokesmen of the American conservative movement, believes he's a conservative because he favors universal equality and sees the American state as a vehicle for spreading equality everywhere. 
and this is conservative, and as he becomes the leading figure at National Review, uh, already in the time of William Buckley in the early 1970s, um, something that I think Peter Brimlow and I have probably, probably been unaware of for many years after, you know, after this happened, um, it, it was obvious that you know, these, these radical leftists, radical leftist, even Trotskyists, Jacobin, they all became part of the conservative agenda. And this was before the neoconservatives took over the conservative movement. Um, and I, 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 I think this perhaps, I should say this in closing, that it's, uh, uh, that, that I, you know, my, my discussion of Murray Rothbard uh, shows that although he expressed these very individualistic uh, ideas and so forth, that in some ways he was profoundly conservative in his social cultural views. There's no question that he, and, and I have this sort of touching scene in which he and Russell Kirk, who's sort of this Burkean conservative, come together uh, in the living room of Pat Buchanan. Uh, we were all on his, I was on his committee when he ran for president in 1992. Uh, and, uh, you know, for, these people were there for different reasons. Obviously, Rothbard did not buy his, uh, Roth, uh, uh, Buchanan's protectionism, neither did I. Um, but he liked him on foreign policy and generally agreed with him on immigration. Um, uh, I, Kirk was there because his wife nagged him into going or something like that. A very domineering wife, who, and uh, she generally controlled all of his actions. Uh, and she told him he was going to serve on this committee. But when, when the two of them began to speak, it was obvious they agreed on much more than they disagreed about. And Kirk had, this might interest you, Kirk always thought of himself in, within the American context as a Taft Republican. He was always a Taft Republican, and he was an isolationist. And uh, he sort of got drafted into World War II when he was in, put in charge of minding some, uh, some army base out in the, in the deserts of Utah, but he was never really in the war. And I think that's when he first read, Al, he first read um, Albert Knopf, when he was in that situation. And um, uh, as much as he spoke about Burke and European concern, he was a small town American. And uh, uh, the, um, uh, he, uh, in the in the post-war years, of course, he writes about the you know the conservative route, which then becomes the conservative victory when he's able to sell the books uh, or finds a publisher who changes the title uh, of his book. Uh, it wasn't Victor Conservative Mind. You see, it's alive and well in America and so forth. Um, uh, he didn't believe that for a second, but I think his conservatism in the American context was basically sort of anti-New Deal, isolationist, uh, uh, maybe American republicanism, you know, of, of, of the tap variety, and that was pretty much Rothbard's view. And I remember I was in them talking with them, and we all agreed, you know, so when it came to the United States, you know, what was best for America politically at that point, I don't think there was much disagreement. The, the other, the, the, this it really is the final point. I must take exception with my gracious host on one, on one, one point. I don't think uh, the John Randolph Club, which both of us were involved, disintegrated over the, or, or fell apart primarily over Pat Buchanan. Um, I, I think actually people on both sides generally supported him. And Murray Rothbard was an ardent supporter of Pat Buchanan. Um, it fell apart because of a person who remained unmentioned, uh, who I uh, think did everything he could to seize power within that group, and basically drove the rest of us out. Whether you're on the paleo-conservative or paleo-libertarian side made no difference. Um, but I have to agree with Hans that it was a group that showed at one time enormous promise. I do mention this in my, in my, uh, my book. Um, I, I think one can be critical of the fact that I do not deal as harshly with that event as I might have. I try to be gracious even toward ex-friends, for former friends uh, in the work. Uh, but I, I think the, the John Randolph Club at one time was a very promising vehicle um, for a paleo-libertarian, paleo-conservative alliance. Um, uh, there were obviously differences, but I think these differences became exaggerated because of the person who eventually caused the break to come about who is not in this room, I should mention. So I feel free to speak about this. Um, uh, and I do go into a discussion of the John Randolph Club. It's, 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 a, it's a bit superficial. 
but you know, I do suggest that at one time it did offer a significant means for bringing conservative groups together. Um, in, uh, I also point out, you do very well to pick up this book. It is, uh, I, I read it over and I am delightfully surprised by the elegance of my own prose. I usually don't write this way. Uh, I, I write sort of in heavy Weberian you know, terminology, whether I'm writing English or German or anything else. But this book is very, very, it's a pleasure to read, um, yeah, even for me and for my students to whom I assigned it. In any case, thank you for your indulgence. <laughs>